also by acknowledging the traditional custodians of land. And when we do so, any time we do a class like this and we, we acknowledge um, country, I like to remember the fact that there is actual value in Aboriginal knowledge to us and the way we look at the world, and particularly in the concept of passing on stories to children. That's something that's integral to Aboriginal culture and it's something that we should bear in mind too, something we can learn. Um, Shrek as an ideological operation, um, or I'd like to say let me destroy your childhood, but you never really had one in the first place. I apologise if I read a bit of this, and please interrupt me at any stage if you have an idea or a thought or you want to challenge something that I've said. Um, I prefer that, actually. I really like when people are disagreeing with me and arguing with me. It's a lot more fun than standing here in the dark room. Um, this point to all literature that I want to make absolutely clear. Those times when you think choices are made by you as a reader or by a writer as a composer, or in the case of Shrek, um, directors as well, and producers and so on. Um, those, those times when choices are made that have, you think, no more substance than pure aesthetics or perhaps some sort of plot device, those moments when you think a choice is totally superficial or perhaps a feel-good moment in a beautiful tale of fantasy and romance, it's in those moments that you are, to quote the, I love this Slovenian psychoanalytic philosopher Slavoj Žižek, knee-deep in ideology. Has anyone heard of Žižek before? Okay, sweet. He's funny, and look him up if you get a chance. But the accent's so dense, it's really hard to get through. But he's really interesting. Can I write it? Yeah. That was really well executed. Um, what do I write it on? I tell you what. I tell you what. It's on the um, the last slide. Just remember that. But Z I Z E K. Where do I write this? <laughs> Sorry, I'm with all this technology. <laughs> if you have, you know, during your holidays a spare moment and lots of patience, there you go. Gizek. Carbon's everything, it's quite amazing. Anyway, those moments when you think a choice is being made. Just purely superficially, that's just the way it was. You know that particular cam that particular camera angle. We chose that just because. Duh. Everything is deliberate in a film. Those moments when you think that a choice is being made purely superficially, you're knee deep in ideology at that point in time. And nowhere are we more knee deep in the thick of it than when we look at the values, morality, aesthetic, epistemological, and ontological contours of children's literature. When we look for ideology, we're looking for the hidden structures and messages that make up the substance of our communication. So all those values and things, the lens that you look at the world, that get transmitted through your communication, all those subtleties of communication, that's ideology. Things that are going on beneath the surface, that lens that you use to approach life. The classic example of this cited by Zizek is Starbucks coffee, although I want to appropriate it to um, the Australian context the thing called Rainforest Alliance Certified Coffee. Now, yesterday at Arimba, I was struggling, because like, this is the second time I've been to Caledonian campus ever, where the, um, we, we, this is the Imperial Center, and Arimba, where the marginalized mother. <laughs> Today I'm speaking back to the Imperial Center, so I feel quite intimidated by all of you. Um, Rainforest Alliance Certified Coffee. So yesterday, yeah, sorry, two days ago, I was up here. It's Isabella's, this joint just here that I was trying to think of. They don't have this Rainforest Alliance certified coffee, but um, uh, Flory Jeans does in Australia, yes? Um, you may have seen it, and probably at Glory Jeans is the most probable place. Um, twice the size, four times the sugar content. Rainforest Alliance certified coffee is available around the world, the partnership between coffee providers and coffee growers, and it's explained on their website our little green frog is recognised by consumers around the world as the symbol of environmental, social and economic sustainability. How then does this work? You look for the little green frog at your cafe or Gloria Jeans, and that's assuming you're not 
foolishly maintaining the uh, boycott against Gloria Jean's that the gay community was putting in place because they were funding the Australian Christian lobby. Really obscure. So let's say you're still you know, you're not one of those people who's actually maintaining that pointless boycott and you're drinking at Gloria Jean's. You look for your cup of coffee. You look for the green frog. You buy your cup of coffee and you do not feel guilty about the heinous conditions that third world coffee growers have to operate under. You don't feel guilty for that because you've actually paid the price for your consumerism and it's built into your cup of coffee. You don't feel guilty, you've made your kind donation, go and feel good about yourself, no more effort required. That's ideology today. Not the alleged class warfare of legislating to help people with a disability or applying a tax to phenomenally rich money magnates who spend their time suing their children. The ideology of today is so deep, so immersive, that we've missed it entirely. It's that ideology of consumerism, of oppression and the injunction all across society and popular culture, the injunction to enjoy yourself. Give up control and passively enjoy it. Is everybody with me so far? Any questions? I'm getting to Shrek, I promise. Um, but this is sort of the the lens that I'm using to come at Shrek. So we need to give you this concept of ideology first. Um, <clears throat> this ideological injunction to enjoy and to accept the machinations of society as irreversible and ever-present is made brutally palpable in children's literature. Perhaps so, because like religion, it's best you get in early before questioning minds start to ask those questions. Let me give you a broad example, a wonderful meme that was doing the rounds on the internet that summed up the hidden ideological content of several popular Disney films. Um, So, I mean, I'd go with Princess Jasmine first, probably because, you know, Middle East is apt. As a woman, your political worth is reduced to your marriageability. Uh, Cinderella, if you're beautiful enough, you may be able to escape your terrible living conditions by getting a wealthy man to fall for you. Uh, Little Mermaid, Ariel, it's okay to... I know all their names. <laughs> it's okay to abandon your family, drastically change your body, and give up your strongest talent in order to get your man... Once he sees your pretty face, only a witch's spell could draw his eyes away from you. Like the cold witch of the sea. Oh, well, she was born rich, I suppose. Although she was born into that sort of sea aristocracy. So. She was the princess. Outrageous. Yeah. Her father had golden scepters flying around the place. So, and the other observation we had to make was, you know, yesterday at Arimble, we were chatting about the fact that uh, Belle from Beauty and the Beast... Um, Appearances don't matter. What counts is what's in your heart. Unless you're a girl, then appearances matter. Big time. If you're the bloke, as Brooke and I were saying before, the beast is actually more attractive than his human form. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah he, well, that's it. He transformed into, you know, a, yeah, a homo. Like yeah, he was hideous. But as the beast, and, and Brooke canvassed this for us yesterday afterwards. Which, sorry, I'll just have to open this one up. But um, Brooke actually pointed out that while we're on the topic of, you know, beasts, um, Chewbacca. <laughs> so, basically, that's the meme that we were looking at, yeah, that I was talking about yesterday. So, yeah. Um, what's this? Oh. <laughs> That's only because she's one of my favourite actresses. Um, and here we go, a few more. Snow White, her burgeoning sexuality is a threat to another woman, so she's killed. Her only asset, physical beauty, is what saves her in the end. Um, what's the one's name from Sleep? I was hoping she didn't have a name, because that would have made my point even better. But, and the fact that I can't remember, what does that say? They sort of chuck out the name of Laura once at the start of that film. And they never say anything. Betrothed at birth to solidify a political position, she's killed by another woman out of spite. Her owner, fiancé, saves her with a kiss. Again, sex is her only salvation. 
So what's the message we're taking out of this? I'll throw it over to you guys. sit and we absorb these messages and values from a film and we enjoy it, but there are things going on there are subtle pieces of text that we don't, I mean you know, you ruin, you ruin a joke by analysing it that <laughs> you actually make Disney movies they're good enough as they are, but they get even better when you do this to them so. See, I love Disney. Love yeah, the same, same. And I've got song she sings at the start is she's sort of mincing through the village no, with a book. gendered stereotypes of women and subverting the fairy tale form to empower minorities. Do we agree? Yes? Anybody got some um, flesh that out for me? Actually tell me now. So, for all its apparent success in decentering the Western subject, um, the oppressive colonial conqueror rendered absurdly blatant in Lord Farquaad. So he represents your ancient white man, um, Jafar to Jafar to what's her face? Is there? Is, would you say Sea Witch to Ariel? I'm trying to think. This. Yeah. Yeah, but is she is she the white man in that film? Do you know what I mean? I'm trying to. Establish here yeah. who your dominant. The main one. Mm. I mean, you, it's sort of a. T- it's That's it. Well, it's a tie between her father, who's obviously dominant white man. Off you go. He's controlling his daughter. Rah rah. The sea witch. Oh no! Actually, maybe I really like the sea witch because she's so subversive. She's so evil. You've always got to start with bad guys in Disney films. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, true. And she's purple skin, and she's probably the only character with not white skin in that film. 
Yeah. Um, Shrek actually accomplishes nothing by the way of emancipatory politics. So it doesn't do anything to liberate people. This is my thesis for this lecture. One might be tempted to make a feminist reading of the text, but to scratch beneath the surface, you'll find a deeply anti-feminist film. Shrek seems to champion the underdog, what Indian post-colonial scholar Gayatri Spivak, should I put that up there as well? She's really cool too. Um, so Spivak used this term, um, the subaltern classes. So oppressed, marginalised, victimised. Um, beside from the central protagonist Shrek the Ogre, whereabouts does the subaltern manifest in this film? If we accept the symbolic framework of Shrek, to be subaltern requires the possession of supernatural characteristics. The fairy tale creatures that Lord Farquhar, as Lord Farquhar calls them, a nameless hegemonic group of oppressed subjects, are the victims here. It's superficially parallel with the Jews exiled from Zion or tortured during the Holocaust. The echoes of historical tragedy notwithstanding, there's a deeper reason, uh, reading that really needs to be brought to the surface. Shrek is a film that, while set in medieval far, far away, is deeply embedded with the values of the 21st century, late capitalist, consumerist, neoliberal, post-feminist ideologies. There are plenty of masculine characters, but where are the women? Who are the women in Shrek? There are a couple. I'm not saying enough. Maybe I have. Um, aside from minor voiceless female side characters, so you've got that old lady at the start that had donkey on a rope. Everyone's seen Shrek. Okay? Mm -hmm. you know, YouTube doesn't have any videos up there. I'm going to copyright it or something, so I can't actually steal it off the internet and embed it into this thing so you could watch it. But I know, but I hate the second film. I, I like the first a lot. I hate the second one. I haven't seen the ones after that because I think they'll just get worse. No, oh, it's, it's Hollywood flogging a dead horse. If you think of a franchise that got better as it went on, Iron Man, if you've seen Iron Man 3, it's excellent. It's probably the best of the three. Pardon? Iron Man. Oh, it is unbelievable. That's because I think Tony Stark is the best character in that movie. He's fantastic. Star Wars got better and better as it, well no actually no that's not oh oh sorry yeah no George Lu this is why I'm looking forward to JJ Abrams doing Star Wars because George Lucas is a bad writer so if you get rid of him they might actually improve but if you, the original Star Wars is the one that everyone studies but it's very simple and then you go to the second Star Wars Empire Strikes Back which is the best of all of them um, and then and then you go to the third one, Return of the Jedi, so you actually get a bit of a re rich, you know, vein of narrative to talk about good and evil, rah, rah, rah. But then when you loop back to the new ones, and I love the new ones, but that's because, I mean, I like Transformers. I will, if it has explosions and spaceships, I am there. It is fantastic. But they don't have the same sort of richness that the, the original trilogy has. Um, Iron Man got really good by the third. Shrek, right off. Even in the second, right? And they wasted, you said it yesterday, Jennifer Saunders wasted her in that film. She should have been drunk. <laughs> um, where was I? Something about masculines. Oh, that's right, yeah. Aside from. She should have been drunk. Jennifer Oh, no, no, no. I mean, well, I suppose, yeah, but they, well, as I'll show you in a moment, they actually get away with doing things in these films. They hint at them. Just like years and years and years ago when they couldn't show sex in a film, in Casablanca, for example, I haven't seen it, but I've heard of this moment where they sort of hint, hint, hint at something, like, you know, this tension between these two characters, and then bam, they jump to cigarette yeah. outside a bedroom. You know, how risque, but you know what happens. So, and they can hint at that in kiddies' films. Yeah, oh, they have drunk characters. They just sort of don't say, this is drunk. So, there are really only two central female figures in Shrek, and that's Princess Fiona and the dragon. You've got the old lady early on, um, but I don't... She's so pointless. She's got, you know, 
30 seconds, and that's it. And she's an old crone, so you don't expect, you know, do you really want me to sort of psychoanalyze like two seconds of an old lady saying, Look at Todd. Um, <laughs> Princess Fiona and the dragon, and the dragon's mockingly identified as a girl dragon. You know how he drags it out? I'm not going to even try to mimic Donkey's voice, because it's probably I tried yesterday, and the I'm bad at it and it's almost offensive. So, a girl dragon, he drags it out. Um, and Donkey, FYI, and we will come back to this, is the only character voiced by a black actor in the film. <laughs> yeah, is, that, is that really what it is, a breeze? The termites, <laughs> they've lifted their game. Um, yeah, Donkey's the only character voiced by a black actor and he's dating the dragon. And if it wasn't for that size differential, I'd probably warn the dragon about a bit of Chris Brown thing going on there. Mm -hmm. To quote, there's a great article by these Australian um, writers, Takalanda and Makui, it will be on the last slide so you can have a look at it. It's a good article. What we have in Shrek, with its heroic male, Jekyll and Hyde female, uh, sorry, heroic male and Jekyll and Hyde female, um, is another version of the male as normative Shrek. However, in a remarkable sleight of hand, presents man not only as the authentic, but also as the marginalised. So you see the white male in Shrek, Shrek himself, as the authentic character you identify with. But he's also the marginalised character because his, he's the one who's been inconvenienced. His swamp has been taken from him. He's got to go on a mission to throw off the oppressor. Anybody have anything to say so far? Keep rolling for a little bit. So the bulk of my discussion today is going to centre around the treatment of women in Shrek and how it's a deeply anti-feminist text. And I'll also explore the way blackness is represented in the film. So first, let's establish a little context. Um, in 2003 study conducted by these uh, Laurie Baker Spelly and Liz Grauholt, they noted that 94% of fairy tales make some reference to physical appearance and that women's beauty is mentioned five times as much per tale as men's handsomeness. They also note that in tales where physical attraction, attractiveness can lead to danger, 89% involve harm to women. Harm. And that's 89%. Absolutely wild. It's unsurprising, quite frankly, and one hopes, looking back at the Disney women we considered earlier, that were they around today, they would be front and centre at Slut Walk, across the Hub Bridge or whatever. Um, and this violent focus on appearance is crucial in understanding the social economy that governs Shrek. There are actual scenes from Disney films. I wish, I wish there was more like this. You could actually just sort of smash the point home. That one's... Princess Fiona, an empowered female it seems, is not allowed at any point to be feminine. Her femininity is crushed absolutely first in spirit through her subverted mother-come-warrior role. So she starts off, you know, the first scene that you see Fiona, she's lying, passive, asleep, wakes up for a moment quickly to grab flowers to make herself more attractive. Um, and then as soon as she wakes up, all the femininity, she sort of turns into this nagging, annoying, complaining, whinging sort of like a parody of other Disney women. You're supposed to rescue me, this is how it's supposed to be, true love's first kiss, rah, rah, rah. And then after that, she turns into, she starts taking on all these masculine traits. So she's a hunter, she kills that bird, favourite scene in the movie. She kills that bird and steals its eggs, starts this domestic housewife routine where she has to serve Shrek and Donkey their breakfast. And then as, the time, as time goes by in the movie, she becomes masculine, she becomes an ogre. So that is the symbolic death. Um, this is a, a Zizek concept as well. There's, 
these two deaths that you get caught between, the symbolic death of the character Fiona, so as soon as she wakes up, the vision that we have of her as a female is destroyed. And then there's the physical death later on in the film where she becomes an ogre. So she's actually physically transformed. And the duration of the film is about her move between the two deaths, from symbolic death to actual physical death. Um, within the symbolic economy of the film, of course, we're supposed to accept that she is beautiful just as she is in ogre form. But that overlooks a huge range of subtle oppressions. Shrek is not permitted to marry outside of his class. Fiona is returned as an ogre and rendered totally masculine, farting, being offensive, living in squalor, and in subsequent awful sequels, um, she's implausibly related into the rich overclass. In, in, is it Far, Far Away? What's that other joint called? That's what it's called. Yeah, she becomes this rich ogre related to John Cleese and, and whoever the other one was. The message is dangerous. Find the love of your life. Marry them. That's all you need. Don't challenge the status quo. Don't civilise. Don't attempt to pursue knowledge or the liberation of your fellow creatures. How on earth did an adventure that started out as a bid to free fairy tale creatures from Shrek's obvious hovel of a home turn into a celebration of Christian marriage in a church? That's the climactic point in the film. A marriage. First between one of the, you know, this rich aristocrat and I suppose a prince marrying a princess and then turns into just a couple of hobos getting married, but still in a church. Where's the radical message in that? I feel like I should be stopping to give you guys time to throw something at me, but at the moment we'll just sort of roll through and then we'll stop where it gets more interesting. Um, so we're supposed to feel suddenly good for all the fairy tale creatures. This wedding has happened and what about the rest of the the marginalised freaks in that society. <coughs> Who cares? Doesn't matter. Weddings just happen. Forget about it and everybody celebrate. Just because Lord Farquaad has been killed, you know, this, the oppressive state hasn't been taken down. All his soldiers are still rolling around the place. They're probably going to immediately go and suppress the celebration. You would think, except in sense. But... Um, and he gets consumed by a premenstrual pink dragon. Ends the film on this huge, vague note. What is going on here? You see this wedding and you are supposed to accept that as the end. There's ideology functioning here. Once they're happily married, they ever after. Once they're happily married, everyone can live happily ever after. It's crazy. So we should know from the outset that sexism is made manifest for you manifest in this film. At once a powerful, authoritative, red-headed woman <laughs> trapped alone in a tower whose only option seems to be rescued by the thudding of a crude ogre. <laughs> it, sounds almost, it sounds almost like a metaphor for the terrain of Australian federal politics at the moment, except that where Julia Gillard managed to deliver a scorching critique of misogyny in Australian life, Princess Fiona meets her true love, gets married, and has her body image issues assuaged by the approval of green white man. Could we imagine Princess Fiona on the floor of Parliament House in, in Duloc giving a I have a scream speech about misogyny? Unlikely, since Fiona spends every waking moment of her days killing animals, serving eggs, generally representing the boorishness of human nature with relish. There's no real femininity in Shrek, just more tough people with incidental vaginas. <laughs> Repeat again. Oh, I disagree. But <laughs> um, unfortunately, the prevailing notion of beauty is ultimately the one that succeeds in Shrek. We are asked to buy into the symbolic framework of the story that the swamp is attractive. Um, that Shrek's life is the good life because he seems happy. And perhaps this is the case early on, but I'd argue that the more radical reading of Shrek would have ended with his returning to the swamp unmarried, unloved, and 100% satisfied with his life. Or, and this was the interesting discussion that I liked from yesterday at Limba, what are the more radical ways to end Shrek? Can anybody come up with some? Because we had a couple of good ones, I'll tell you in a moment. So 
So endings that would actually transform your understanding. You'd actually get a, a real change in the meaning of the story. Beautiful. Well, yesterday, we, we didn't go down the university path, but yesterday was the owner decides not to get married and decides to move back to the tower because she likes it there. I mean, it could, but I'd also argue then that she not only turns into an ogre slash man, she starts behaving like a man if she does that. And so men, so women can't run holes, can't be in charge? No, um, <laughs> women, I hope, don't go around killing everybody and dominating the planet. Well, not but killing people, but yeah, if she actually very white, yeah. it's red up, and yeah. I guess anything, so my point about a radical reading is to see that anything that changes the underlying terrain, so the actual structure of power relations between the characters in, in the film, um, or that changes that ideological subtext, those are radical endings to the film. So there is something in there, but how you'd actually structure that change is, is complicated because it can't be just, you know, one woman comes in to replace Lord Farquhar, otherwise it just sort of makes it, oh, you know, okay, it's a woman, but have the actual relations changed on it's the same thing, it's just... If you structure feminism as a... If you structure simply being a woman as radically different to a man, but they're both behaving exactly the same way when they treat their subjects like dominated subjects, if just by virtue of being a woman that makes it a radical reading, then yes. But I don't think if those relationships stay exactly the same and figure at the top changes, nothing's really changed. It's an interesting hypothetical, but I actually think there's so much in Fiona's um, psychology that would make her an even bigger bitch than your part of um, where are we up to now? I've gotten so distracted. Uh, Shrek would have, um, blah, 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 yeah, radical reading, return to swamp, go up the tower, take over all of the kingdom. That he expresses no apparent dissatisfaction with his spinster existence at the start of the film, that's quite, that's quite revolutionary, I like that, at the start. Um, but it gets shattered by the onset of true love, embodied in the utterly conflicted princess Fiona. It's like, the example we used yesterday was like Samantha from Sex and the City. Because she starts off being, you know, sexy and whatever, and I, she does things her way. By the end of it, she falls in love. And then when she finally starts to swing back the other way, they give her cancer. You know what I mean? You can't actually live like that if you're a woman. Unfortunately, oh, I've already said that. I'm going to quote here at length from um, Takalander and McHughie. That's that article I was telling you about before. Who explained the function of Dragon, the other woman in the film, quite perfectly. In Shrek, Dragon, that's drag on, drag, queen, drag on, the gender imposter who is ensconced in a phallic tower of female solipsism as the real representation of female masculinity as the genuine threat to gender difference and thus to the entire system of patriarchy is both reduced to another form of femininity and sexually humiliated. To begin with, she is wooed by donkey's flattery and transformed into a grotesque eyelash batting parody of femininity. She's then chained up and humiliated by Shrek. Later mastered, she becomes Shrek and donkey's pet. They put a bridle on her and ride her around. If Fiona is metaphorically speaking along for the ride, 
dragon is literally ridden. Um, the recurring motif here is that men do not have to change, but women do. The basic premise of the film postures women as a tool for the gratification of men. For Farquhar's assessed, uh, ascent to the throne, she acts as a foil to Shrek's ascendant masculinity, because you've actually got this tension between two male characters in the film. Lord Farquhar as the existing dominant alpha male, and Shrek as the up-and-coming Silverback, who's about to challenge. And Fiona acts as a foil to that, between both of them. And when she confronts the pseudo-rapist Monsieur Hood out in the, the bush on their way there, a man who likes to get head and desires to get busy with women, Shrek bellows possessively at him, she's my princess, go and get your own. My princess. Fiona is selected by Farquaad, rescued by Shrek, delivered to Farquaad and then reclaimed by Shrek. It's a game of tennis between two men and the fall is a woman. She is neither independent nor free. If you want to see Cameron Diaz in a liberated role, I strongly recommend Charlie Daniels. Especially in the rest of the Yo. Oh, okay. get to it in a moment, and this is why I try to avoid number two, because it complicates, because the reason I hate the second one, is not because, and I don't, I mean, I don't hate this one, well, it doesn't have to say something, I don't hate the one that said this is The reason I don't like the second one, is because it's totally articulated within this consumerist capitalist world. The, what they create in Far, Far Away is LA. Like, right down to the actual geographical layout of it, it's LA. And it's, it's monstrous really depressing image of the world that kids will absorb. I guess this is the point of the whole thing. But Fiona's ugliness should be revolutionary, except that it's articulated as a defence against a threat to Shrek's masculinity. So she can't be attractive versus Shrek. Remember that the one who complains in the film, she's quiet about it. She starts the film off hidden up in a phallic tower and she appears attractive the whole way through. And then later on when she's in the vaginal cave, when you first clue into the fact that she's, something's going on with her, you know, the eyes sort of peering out while Donkey and Shrek are looking at the stars. Shrek's the one complaining about how he looks. He's the one who's, when Donkey's sort of peeling back the layers of the onion, Shrek's the one who's upset that people judge him on the way he looks, not Fiona. So, that threat that Fiona represents to Shrek's masculinity, her attractiveness, has to be blunted by her being rendered hideous. And she's hideous. Uh, they never render Belle hideous, but she has to stay pretty. But the beast is more attractive as a beast. <laughs> I feel that that's I feel that's an objective observation. He does look like Fabio. Um, Fiona's ontological crisis, her inability to secure her identity, can only be resolved by a man. It can only be resolved by Shrek. She becomes his sexual beast of burden. And as we'll see now, this role is mimicked by the literal beast of burden, Donkey. So the shocking climactic moment of Shrek is the, you know, Deus Ex moment where Donkey bursts in through the, um, bursts in through the window and screams at him, a donkey on the edge, riding the dragon. And I feel that, you know, not only the fact that he's sort of dominating this woman, but it's a dragon, so it sort of feels like black man dominating Asia. Yes. Am I picking at straws here? Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. Um, so, you know, and the pink dragon bursts in, consumed with traumatic fear of the situation, and what does she do? Like any, you know, traumatised woman, she eats. <laughs> it's 
So, no, it wasn't sweet. It was quite sour. Um, Darren Brabham's excellent essay, Animated Blackness, argues for a critical reading of the character Donkey as exemplar of uh, scholar Stuart Hall's three tropes of blackness. Native, slave, and clown. Says Brabham, that Donkey is an animated animal without black skin does not hide the fact that Donkey is a black character in support of the more important narrative of white characters falling in love. Shrek represents a very narrow conceptualization of blackness, providing its main intended audience, children, with a potential lesson in what blackness is and should be. I haven't had a chance to do this to Madagascar, but I will because I have another film I love. But that's on the King Julian is basically my life idol. That's a really good question. And I, what we'll do, because we'll get through this, because I actually think, um, what's his name? Marty, is it? I just call him by their animal. Yes. Yes. We'll go through these three tropes of blackness, but I want you to, you know, park that for a moment, because that's actually a really interesting observation in light of what we're about to say. Um, Donkey's not human. In fact, throughout the entire film, only Lord Farquaad and his de-identified minions are the humans. Within the symbolic economy of the film, being human is impossible unless you are a white male. We'll just ignore the crone for a little bit and you know, someone yelling out. But anybody who's given any substantial time as a human is a male. Fiona's a female. But she's an ogre. And she's turned into a male. Being human is impossible unless you're a white male, otherwise you're simply a freak. And while Shrek may superficially celebrate being a freak, what does that say about the rest of us actual human beings? Um, unless we're dominant white heterosexual males, we're not eligible for inclusion in the social order, perhaps. Brabham explains that Shrek himself is a distinctly white character. The film is articulated in a fantasy imaginary reality full of fairy tale creatures. And we thus need to look beyond appearances, as is so often the case in fairy tales, uh, Beauty and the Beast, perfect example, and explore the tropes that construct the characters. So it's not enough for us to look at Donkey on the surface as a little animal tearing around. You actually need to look at beneath the surface, at the way he's, he's verbalised, the way he's written. What are the tropes that make up Donkey? Shrek himself is a Scottish man, fat bastard, Turn green. That is what he is. It's the same voice. It's the same actor. Um, and he's less of a dispossessed indigenous and more of an inconvenienced mortgage holder struggling against the bureaucracy. So, the way he describes my land, it's not, it's not my land in, 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 the, in the indigenous Aboriginal sense of my land, you know, our land, a place. It's a possession. It's a Western way of thinking. The example I use, I like you said Western, because I think Western Sydney. My land, you know what I mean? Get out. And, and political. Does it not sound like get your, you know, fairy tale creatures, refugees out of my land? There are these echoes there of, of social issues and ideas that we, we see today. This was only made in 2001. It was made about four. It was released about four or five months before September 11. So, had this film come out, you know, even two years later, I mean, in Australia we had uh, Tampa happen. Yeah, about five months after this, had this happened after that, and this acted as the fulcrum, you would actually see a lot of these values that you're seeing in this film reflected really harshly. Or was it sort of something that happened before all that happened? We don't think about it. It's that ideology. Um, so yeah, I just I, the, the way he uses the expression my land, it's possessive he wants to kick out these refugees into his land he's a white male a dominant white Scottish male keep this whiteness in mind for a moment because I first want to touch on, on those three categories of blackness So the first is donkey as a native 
So as alluded to earlier, Donkey's representation as a black native is typified most apparently through his obscene sexuality. Arguably the only character in the film to actively exhibit sexual rather than romantic libidinous traits. So the relationship between Shrek and Fiona is romantic, it's cute. Um, Lord Farquaad, it's that sort of masturbatory thing. It's not overtly person-to-person -person sexual. It's possessive in the case of Fiona, and it's gross in the case of himself. Um, Donkey's overtly sexual, echoing the raw, innate native sexuality that you'd expect to find up the Belgian Congo. Donkey even refers to his animal magnetism when he successfully seduces a large female dragon with his irresistible sexual energy. Were he not blackness embodied in the form of an ass, the connotations of bestiality would be wildly confronting. What he exemplifies is to use Brabham expression, the raw, primitive, sexual power over another non-human beast. Donkey's also unable to dine at the table with Shrek. So while we look at the ingredients of Shrek's cocktails that he's making, eyeballs, earwax, you know, feces, whatever, he's making cocktails with them. He's not eating them raw, at least, you know, if we can redeem him somehow for eating these gross things, at least he's mixing them together. But Donkey has to eat outside. Shrek sits at the table, Donkey sits outside. Shrek uses his knife and fork, Donkey sits outside with books. What can you do? That sets up, it echoes racial segregation. So black sea has gone by, and which brings us to the next of Brabham's three tropes, and that's Donkey as a slave. And Donkey's opening scene is chained and offered for sale. The scene reads suspiciously like slaves being sold at a market, prized for unique skills and abilities. And Donkey escapes to, quote Brabham here, beg for mercy from a white man. So you know the scene. He gets away. He looks like Eeyore as he's running. Um, and then he bumps into Shrek. And at one point he actually gets down like this and he's like, I'm begging, and then jumps up, please, 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 I need your help. So he's begging for mercy from a white man. And arguably that's probably the most offensive scene in the entire film. His relationship from here on seems servile to Shrek and takes on the same aspect as the arrival of initially white Fiona. Shrek even refers to him in an abusive tirade as a dense, irritating, miniature beast of burden. And straight up, Fiona refers to him as Shrek's pet. So it really runs home the point about possession. Donkey's obviously, um, obviously able to communicate. His presence as a central character in the narrative lends him, he should have, less of a submissive role. So why is it, then, that Donkey is submissive to all these other characters? He's able to speak. He drives the plot forward by helping Shrek. And yet he is submissive. He's dominated by Shrek and Fiona and virtually every other character in the film. The only character over whom he has any dominance is the enormous dragon, who is a woman. Um, and it's probably also worth mentioning that Donkey is the only character who doesn't have a name. He's just Donkey, apart from dragon. But they're both dragon, Donkey, no names, everybody else has an identity, and they're stripped of it. So far, he's a victim, thank you all for it. And all these, all these camera shots are pointing down. We had this big long discussion yesterday about yeah, the, ca the character Eddie Murphy. I mean, what I was about to say in a moment, actually, here. Um, the last of those three tropes is, is Donkey is a clown. Um, and that's really obvious. You don't really need to dwell on that too much because he's obviously a performer and an entertainer all the way through the film. Um, but, but, yeah, could you imagine any other actor than Eddie Murphy playing that role? It's like it was written for him. And it probably was. We're assuming he's written as a black character, 
and they chose the most. Is that mine? Am I making that noise? Oh, sweet, because I hit my phone. Um, so it's, yeah, like you're absolutely right in, when you think about the, why Eddie Murphy, why that actor. He is a caricature of blackness. That's how he's made his career. By, you know, it's like that character Malik in um, Not Another Teen Movie, who mocks, you know, the token black guy. And, and that's what Eddie Murphy is. All the, his whole career is built around these tropes and these traits of blackness and sort of. And, and hamming them up for the camera, and that's why they've chosen him, and they've framed Donkey in this way. Does that make sense? Are you, are you with me so far? Or you disagree, please, anybody? So yeah, Donkey is clown. Donkey is entertainer. Um, his emotional volatility and his intellectual simplicity, which lunge from irrational glee to uncontrolled panic, can only be stabilised by Shrek. Donkey is utterly dependent on his master in order to function. And as a clown, he sings, he dances, he's a natural entertainer, he produces a very stage of soulful black rhythm, um, he's a chatterbox, he's Eddie Murphy in everything but appearance. There's this quote by Bradman that I think is brilliant. The others perform for the white audience always, for they only exist as marginalised other if they perform starkly in contrast to the centred discourse. This is why I am the Arimba Campus guy up here in front of this centre. <laughs> um, incidentally, has anybody seen Lost, the TV show, ABC in the US, years ago? So the first season, before Lost became really bad in season four, I'm sorry, I'm dragging in all these pop cultural references there. Um, before Lost became really bad in season four, they had The Others in season one, and it was just pure, has anyone done post colonial lit? Have you run it? So I hate to keep invoking the leader, but you know, I mean, the other, that's so obvious. But, yeah, hmm. It just works so well with, with all kinds of literature, though, that, that, that reading of processes of othering. But basically, in Lost, in season one, you have the others, and they're these creepy, totally silent guys far off in the distance, the only time you sort of see them coming is this plume of smoke at the end of season one, black smoke, and then they rock up and they vanish characters off stage, and they are totally, totally silent. And I think that the others in Lost are the most radical version of other that I can imagine because they embrace silence. So anytime you sort of look at discourses, Donkey is only allowed to speak when Shrek will allow him to speak, and he's either told how irritating he is, he's tempered, he's silenced by Shrek. What I love about the others in Lost is it's not being silenced, it's taking the silence and running with it. such a way to get a reflection of ourselves and to get an understanding of ourselves in opposition to the other. Yeah, so you actually you find that someone like Donkey is actually set up as another, not only in support of this more important narrative, but he's actually you know, put a side of contrast, I guess, with the, the dominant discourse.
But you can't, I just, they would have rewritten it. They would have had different dialogue. Because yeah. all, you know, half the stuff you've done is, it wouldn't make sense if it wasn't mocking. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Although, is it, I don't believe it's actually a white guy. Yeah, yeah. white guy. But in the way he sings it, and he sort of appropriates this white song. Actually, we were talking about this yesterday. It's the idea of mimicry. So Donkey comes across as an idiot. He's failing miserably at actually being... He's trying to live up to this standard that he thinks Shrek has set for him, and he's failing miserably constantly. He's trying to mimic his master, and it's not working all the way through the film. So these tropes of guilt... You know, I have a seizure at the end? Yeah. Yeah. Wrong. I haven't seen it yet. I kept saying it, so I'll have to try and put some like I will actually have to make a point of doing it tonight. Is it? Yeah. Mental note, the pirate bay dot com. Contrarily, Donkey, unlike the others in Lost, he's, he's never silent. He raves on and on and on and on. And his voice, like I said, is only given space when Shrek chooses to give it space. So how do we break this uh, ideological deadlock? Where we have... We look at this film and we go, where is our way out? How do we establish a radical break with this traditional narrative? Zizek often refers to the role the Jews played in Hitler's ideology, the way they were positioned as the insidious enemy Jewish plot that was responsible for the economic tragedy of Weimar Germany. In fact, the Jews were used as a scapegoat, a problem to which a final solution could be found, a concrete enemy for the German nation to focus its anger and rage on, rather than pay attention to the underlying true problems that were facing Weimar society. Hitler was not, argued Zizek, a radical leader at all. His fundamental project was the acquisition of power and the perpetuation of power structures that had existed for centuries before. He didn't want to change the fundamental form of power in German society. Rather, he used the Jewish plot as a mechanism to distract people from the inequity, injustice, and socially debilitating nature of the very form of capitalist imperialist society in Germany at the time. Rather than question the brutal dictator, people would say, we'll blame the invasive Jew. What does this represent? It's a mystification, a method whereby the content can be changed, the content of a message is changed, but the form is not. The form remains constant, and it's here that we see the basic ideological form of Shrek rather than actually changing the coordinates of fairy tale fantasy, rather than achieving a radical breakthrough in an age-old genre, Shrek distracts us with seemingly strong women and an outcast ogre with whom we're encouraged to identify. To quote Zizek, Instead of praising all too fast these displacements and reinscriptions as potentially subversive and elevating Shrek into yet another side of resistance, one should focus on the obvious fact that through all these displacements, the same old narrative is being told. In short, the true function of these displacements and subversions is precisely to render the traditional narrative palpable for our postmodern time, and thus to prevent us from replacing it with a new narrative. There's an old Lacanian expression, Jacques Lacan, I won't put it up there because it's not worth going in, 
but he's this um, sort of a successor to Freud, um, psychoanalyst in the 50s, 60s, and really interesting guy. But he has this saying, um, you've got two kinds of madmen, the, the, the madman who thinks he's a king and the king who thinks he's a king. Who is more mad? And it's the king who thinks he's a king. Because the king who thinks he's a king, who actually believes he's a king, by divine right or, or you know, inheritance or whatever, does not realise that the only reason he's a king is because all the people underneath him recognise him as a king. They only, he can only occupy that position because of the fact that people respect that symbolic role. So if he genuinely thinks that he's a king, he's absolutely crazy. In what regard? Oh, yeah. I guess the thing with Lear, though, because back then um, it was it was the case. So I guess more if we when Lacan was writing, that was in the sixties. So we're dealing in this sort of secular age, and whereas back when back when Lear was written, and whatever Shakespeare might have been, you know, not quite as God fearing as the rest of them. But back when Lear was written, they did believe in the divine right of kings. So they were all mad. Everybody. Everybody back then was crazy. Um, <laughs> so, the role of a monarch is ridiculous enough as it is, but instead Shrek chooses to mock order and perfection as his aesthetic obsessions. It's, an, um, it's the neoliberal attack, what we're talking about here in Shrek, is a neoliberal attack on the structure of the state, because they're not mocking Farquaad for thinking that he's a king. They mock him, for his of his personality traits, his grandioseness, but they mock that structure of the state, a desire to reduce the concept of civil society and government into the realm of snout rages. So they make it look like this is, you know, fuck what is a crazy monarch like Kim Jong-un. What you should be questioning is the structure of a neoliberal society, a market society, that underpinning ideology that you don't get forced to question when you watch this film. So, for example, with the, the king who thinks he's a king, somewhere along the line, someone's got to shatter that symbolic framework. So if you look at that, the emperor's new clothes, someone finally walks along, the young boy, the young child, and I guess this is one of the, the revolutionary exciting things about children's literature. Children take it all in. They've got this sense of wonderment at the world and they'll ask questions. And the child says, but hang on a second, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. And it shatters that symbolic framework that they had built around him. It lays open the ridiculousness of the structure and it transforms it. Truly radical action may not necessarily be because I was told yesterday my ending wasn't punchy enough. So it seems the truly radical action may not, and so I, I'm not, I didn't change it. I just sort of hit it off yesterday, so this is probably going to be really disappointing. The truly radical action may not necessarily be a challenge to authority, but rather the act of critical questioning, destabilizing the frame and the form rather than withdrawing from it. If we look beneath the surface of children's literature at films that are superficially subversive, like Shrek, then we're able to root out the subtle textures that govern the process of social reproduction, 
And we might then be, if not in a position to make a transformative change, take transformative action, but at least we'll be able to identify exactly what it is we're up against. Questions? I have nothing. I had drink, I had beer before the last one. And today I was just, yeah. Flat. I was more controversial maybe, I don't know. Thoughts? Yesterday, so when we did the trial run down at Arimba, and so I know I know a lot of people down there. So um, when we did the when we did this down there, one of the one of the people in the room said that you know what's the point here? Are we saying we can't show this to kids? Is it dangerous to show this to the kids? No, it's not. Why? I mean, you know, you
I guess. Still not happy ending, but it's a different yeah, and that's the thing. I guess my my thing about Shrek is that because I remember when I first watched it, and for years and years and years, and until we had to do this thing for um, ABLR, and I said, well, let's actually sit down and, and work out how you would teach Shrek to kids. And it's always about how do you open up a new way to read something, or open up, and it's, it's such a great way to come at all literature, not just um, children's little comedy that you're teaching, but to sit back and go, what's a new way of reading this text? So we said, what's a new way of reading Shrek? And you stop and you go, well, hang on a second, it's not really changing much. Or you think to yourself, maybe I want to take an angry approach to Shrek, or I want to take feel the opposite way about it that I do. And when I first watched it, I'm like, yep, Shrek, wonderful film, teaches us so much, you know, it's okay to be ugly, well, not that ugly, baby, but you know what I mean, it's okay to be a freak and all this sort of stuff, you know, wonderful. But then when you, and, and you know, films that deal with death, for kids as well, or literature that deals with death, um, or depression, might seem really radical at the surface. I'm not saying all of it is not, but when you actually drill down into it, what actually has changed? What is really different about it? And that's where the catch is for me with Shrek. Is that when you drill down into it, you go, well, nothing's really different.
stretch show you nothing. He becomes slightly less mean. That's not a layer, you know. He, when he when he acquires his possession, a root, then he starts to show his sensitive side, and that's not a layer. That's just another facet of dominant white male hegemony. <laughs>
Fiona's hair is blowing in the wind in, in subsequent films. When she's a warrior or something in the 3D one. Well, I certainly feel powerless then.